Okay. Okay, hi. Sorry about that. I have now got my technical issues sorted out and we have the lab on the screen. And I will be turning off my uh, video camera, but I will still be here. Actually, I'll leave it on. Okay, so for homework three, if you guys haven't taken a look, you will be working on making interactive um, charts with JavaScript in D3. And today what we will be going over is how to make um, interactive scatter plots that dynamically update for the data. And so basically what we have here in this lab, um, which I've posted on the GitHub link that um, for the announcements, so you can see the code there. Um, so when I click the random data, it will dynamically update the line chart. And if I go and I click it again, it will change. And if you pay attention closely, you will see that the X and the Y axes change. So here it's the Y axis is at a thousand and I click it again and now it's 900. And we also have an area chart. And so for this homework, what we will be covering is how do you make the interactive line chart, um, which you will need to know how to do for your homework. And also how do you make an interactive area chart? Okay, so let's take a look at the code. On the Slack? Uh, sorry. Huh? Oh, I'm covering half of the display? Oh, I didn't realize. Okay. Um, oh no, this is really bad. Okay. Uh, okay, let me just um, try and help people who are having trouble connecting. But I am also recording this, so it um, I will post it afterwards. Okay, um, so the first thing that we're going to go over is we're going to take a look at the chart constants. Okay, so... When you make a chart, um, what we have is we have a canvas right here. And within that canvas, you have, you need to create space in order to put our axes. And so right here we have um, our X axes and then our Y axes. But in order to draw it, what we need is we need to create enough space so you can read the legend. And so what they what Mike Bostock suggests to use is to use a margin object. And this syntax right here is um, the CSS style. So it goes top, right, bottom, and left. And so basically what it does is it creates enough space where you can translate your actual SVG graphic to a position that can show both the chart and for the um and for the X and the Y axes as well. And so what um, Mike suggests is that you create a width and you create a height. And this, what you do is you take, you define some kind of constant, which you put for your SVG size, and then you um, subtract part of your margin for your left and for your right for the width. And then for the height, you subtract from the top and the bottom. And depending on what kind of chart you're creating, you have to kind of play around with the numbers so that you can get the translation to work for the X and the Y. So if we go back to my example right over here, what we've said is that in this HTML document, um, this one right here. Okay, so in this HTML document, we have said that our SVG height is 550 and the width is 750. So if we go back to right here, um, what we can do is we can go to inspect and we can see that when I zoom out, okay, so when I zoom out, we can see that I have defined the SVG canvas, which is highlighted in blue, um, as 550 pixels and the width as 750 pixels. Uh, does anyone have any questions? 
about that. Okay, great. So then what um, we do next is we have separate groups for the um, x-axis and the y-axis. And here, um, let me just go to that one. Okay. And so then what we've done is we defined our margin. Um, and in this case, we I just picked some constants. So for the left, I said it was 50, 20 for the bottom, and then 20 for the right. And this constant right here is for animation, which I will talk to you about later. Okay. So in the first part, um, what I do right here is I generate some random data. And so we can print out. Let's see. Okay, so I'm just going to print out the data. And so when I print out the data and click the random function, we will uh, generate an array of 50 data points. And so these represent our X and our Y coordinates for what we're trying to plot on the screen. And so when we go back, what we have here is that, okay, we've generated the data and now we're gonna pass it into this update function. And so the update function is very important for interactive graphics because that's how your data dynamically updates. So you'll have some kind of fu function and what it'll do is like, okay, I wanna change the data set. So if we go back to the assignment, you are required to change the data from US COVID data to Utah COVID data to California and then to New York. So each one of those will have different numbers for your X and your Y. And so the way that we change it is you will want to take uh, reading your data and then you'll have an update function where you will go and draw the data uh, for the charts. And so the first thing that I do go and do is I go and I sort the data from least to great greatest because currently what we have is, um, or it's already been sorted. Um, so this function right here is I go and I sort it from least to greatest because it's randomly generated. So the X and the Ys will be random when it's first loaded. And so what I do right here is I sort it. And so when I print out the data, it will be in sorted order. So we can see that the Xs are in order and they're going from least to greatest. Um, the next thing that I do after that is we are gonna go and create scales. So this is the documentation for these scales. And the way that we think of scales are that um, they are kind of like an f of x function in math. So basically scales, you take an X input, which is our data, and then it outputs a value that will be mapped to the pixel screen. And so the way this works is we first define a linear scale because we have linear data in the visualization. And then we take a domain. So the domain is the value that we want to start at and then the max value in our data set. So if we go back to looking at this data right here, we see that um, our data starts off at zero, that's the minimum value. And the maximum value is, let me just um, move this down, maximum value, okay, yes. The maximum value will be 1,093. And so what you wanna do is you wanna, we know, if we know that the minimum, oh yeah. Okay. No, so the dom you can think of the dom the domain is the values that you are mapping. So we are just creating our scale for the x axes. Um, so right here, I will go back and zoom in. And so what we're trying to do first is we're trying to draw our x axes right here um, for the domain in the range. And so we know that for a line chart, we, it usually starts at zero. And then we go here and we calculate the maximum value. And so d3.max is a helpful function where you can go and add the data set. And then you can say, okay, I just want the maximum of the X coordinate. And the d.x is referring to the X value that's located in the point. 
So now the range. So we have our domain value and D3 does some magic under the hood for the scale linear that it outputs it to a coordinate on the SVG screen. And so this is um, slightly confusing a little bit, at least the first time that I learned this, in that we have coordinates right here, if we go and inspect. And the, what we're trying to do is we're trying to map it from a real world number to our screen space coordinate. So there is some uh, coordinate right here that represents zero, zero. And then there's a max value that 1093 maps to that value. And so what I have done for the for the range is that I've mapped it to the leftmost the leftmost value, which I have defined as margin dot left, which is 50. So it will zero will map to 50. So on the screen in screen space coordinates. 50 represents the minimum. And for the maximum, what I've done is I've taken the chart width, which is 750, and I've mapped that to 750 minus margin dot right, which is 730. So if I go and I change this because it looks hard to read. Um, I can not look. Yes. Why not scale band? Oh, scale band. Why not scale band? Okay, yes. So as you can see on the documentation, there are multiple different types of scales. And so depending on the data that you're using, so we are using linear data because we're making a line chart. So it lends itself to a linear scale. But if you are doing... Um, if you were creating charts that did not have that did not have linear scale, so say you wanted to create a chart with a log log scale, you could specify I want a log log scale, so it will generate an output based on that value. Yes, so scale linear is scale band you want to use for charts that when you're making like bar charts when you care about the the width of each one of your bars and to make that work. And so in our charts right here, we have linear data or I've made it linear. And so we're making a line chart, right? And so we wanna see the see the, um, the x-axis and the y-axis as continuous incrementing. And so that's why it's scale linear uh, for that. Okay, and so I did scale linear for the line chart. And so what I've done is I've mapped it to margin dot left, which is 50. So I'm just gonna change this value. Oh, there's a question. Oh, can you all see? I'm not sure if you have the code up. Okay, can people see my screen? Because I, because I, only on Chrome. Oh, okay. I did not share my screen. Okay, sorry. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? Okay, great. Um, so I will go back then. Okay, uh, I will just have to go back to explain it. Okay, hopefully that'll help. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to go back to explaining why we chose the chart width again. So what we do for the, when we're creating charts, it's very difficult to figure out how do we format our ax, how to create space for our axes and for the individual chart. And so if we go back to the Chrome example that I have right here, oh, um, let's look that Okay, great. So the reason why, okay, so there is a reason why we use constants when creating our charts. So Mike Bostock, who's what, one of the inventors of D3, defined this margin syntax. 
And the reason why we use constants is to figure out how do we create space for our chart and for our axes. And so some authors who create, who use D3 to create charts call the axes peripheral. So they're like additional outside of the main chart. And so what we have in the gray box, it represents our, um, our SVG chart. And that would be the line chart right here in the area chart, but does not include the X axes and the Y axes. So those are additional. And so there's a margin convention that we use to create enough space for the Y axis, which is right here, and the X axes. And so what Mike suggests that we do is you can create a margin. Um, this is his definition. And you don't always use these numbers. It depends on what chart you're creating and the size of your SVG. And the size of the margin has been defined here. And we use the normal CSS styling. So it goes top right here, and then right, and then bottom and left. And so if you look up any CSS margin documentation, that's the ordering that they have. And so then what we do is we create space for our graphic. So this var width right here is to specify the chart width, which is the, for the gray portion, which represents the individual chart. And the chart height represents the chart height, and we subtract some space at the top and from the sides to create space for our axes and for our titles. So that's the reason why we use this margin convention. And what I have done for this example is I have defined my chart width, which is the same size as the SVG, and the chart height, which is also the same size as the SVG. And my margin, I've kind of tweaked from Mike's, and I've defined it as 50, 20, 20, and 20, using the CSS styling. Does anyone have any questions about how this works? Okay. Do you have any questions? Okay, great. Okay, so the first thing that I do at, for this example, is I generate the random data, as you can see right here. And I also go and I print it. So we can take a look at what it looks like. Okay. So I'm going to the console and we can see that I've generated 50 data points. And each one is comprised of a object containing an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. And I have gone right here and I have sorted it in this function. So that's why it's sorted. So once you have loaded all of your data, what you want to do is you want to pass it to a function that will generate your chart. In this case, I call it update. And depending on your chart, it will be interactive and where you will update all of your data and pass it through. So you load your raw data and you pass it to your update function, which is where you will perform all of your chart transformations near render for that. So the first thing that I do in the update function when I pass in the data is I go and I sort it. So if we go and look back at this example, we can see that it's sorted by X coordinate. So we have, it starts off at zero and then goes all the way to 1,029. And so that's the max value for that data set. Okay, so after sorting it, the next thing that we have to do is we have to figure out how to draw our axes and map the real world coordinates that we've generated right here for the random data to pixel coordinates that we can draw on the screen and for our axes. So to do this, there is a really handy D3 function called D3.scale, which is what I was talking about earlier. So you can, oh yeah. If it won't. If you don't sort the data, what would happen with the graph? Oh, it would be all over. So I can go right here and I'll just comment this out. And so if we don't sort the data, we will get um, this chart. So it goes all over the place. And so that's why I sorted it. Uh, no, I just sorted it for this example because the data is random. So I, I generated random numbers between, um, 
So I took a, the random math.random generates a value between zero to one, and it'll generate some integer or sorry, some decimal value. And then I multi scaled it by 25 and multiplied it by the index. And then I rounded it to the nearest whole number. Um, but when you are working with the CSV files from the homework, that will be already um, sorted or in some kind of order. No, you will not have, the data is not randomized. I just created a random data for the lab. Yes, so if you read the instructions, the purpose of the random generator is to generate a random slice of the data. So that's like different. Um, and you'll have to read the instructions. Uh, for that. Okay, so I'm just going to continue on. Um, okay, so we're going back to explaining D3 scale. So you can think of D3 scales as functions f of x in math. And so what a scale does is it takes a real world input as the domain and it maps it to screen coordinates for rendering to the screen. So our real world coordinates for this example were 00, 10, 7, 1566. So this is how we would draw them on a normal on a normal chart by hand, if we were going to graph it by hand. But when we're rendering to the screen, we have to figure out, okay, that doesn't really work because we don't have SVG canvases that big. So we have to scale them accordingly to the coordinates that we're using for the screen. And the coordinates that you render to depend on the size of your SVG and what values you're going to use for that. So what I have done is I've said, okay, we're gonna take our domain, which is from zero to the max of our data set. So this d3.max function takes in the data set as an argument and it returns the x value and finds the maximum x value from the data. And so the maximum x value in our data is 893. And so it says take a value from zero to 893 and map it to screen coordinates, which is created with the range. And what it does is we're gonna take a zero and we're gonna map it to margin dot left which starts off at 50. And so March, the maximum for the range is the chart width minus the chart height. So the chart width is 750 in this case, and the margin dot right is 20. So that would be 730. So our screen coordinates in this case are zero, to 730. Does anyone have any questions about how this works? Okay, there's no questions. Great. Yeah. For which one? The range function? N no. The range function is determining the mapping to screen coordinates. So the domain corresponds to your original data and the range corresponds to what screen coordinates represent the real the values from the domain. Yeah. So like for example, like let's say I have like 16 mm -hmm. or 15 data points, for example, yeah. like 500 pixels in actual. Like I guess the points I can actually plot on. So basically by putting zero, I'll give that zero. Yeah. So actually. Yeah. So what I can do is I can just try and print some values. Uh, let me just do a console. I'm really bad at this. I will go and just take the list. Okay, so I'm just gonna take this and show that. Okay, so I'm just going to show how this works. Um, so I will just try 10. And so if I go back right here and refresh it, 
Okay, so when I typed in 10 for the x-coordinate, it returned 56.18. So 56.18 represents the screen coordinate that is mapped to the real world value 10. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay, we can try another value. Um, oh, yes. So that is part of the homework and yes, categorical would be good to use because the scales that you choose, um, as we can see from right here, depend on the type of data that you're using. So the one that I'm using linear because we have a continuous scale and that's for a line chart, which uses continuous data, d3.scale linear is really good. But when you're using dates, that is a category and doesn't represent a numerical value. So that's why you use a, some kind of categorical scale for that. Okay. Uh, okay, so do you, want, do you want me to try another number for the scaling? Or do you want? Okay, um, that's good. Go. Okay, so for the same thing now, what we're going to look at is how do you do the Y scale? So the Y scale does the same as the X scale when we're creating the domain, except we're using the Y coordinate instead of the X coordinate. But instead, we're drawing from the chart height minus uh, margin bottom minus margin top to zero. And the reason is, is that traditionally for SVG, when you draw the positive coordinates, it draw are in the downwards direction. So we want to draw from top to bottom. And we want zero to be right here. And so the only way we can get zero to get mapped to the bottom for our scale is if we draw, um, if we draw from our max, from the highest value of our uh, let's see, where was it? The highest value of our of our scale to zero. And so if I change this, so I'm just gonna change this value here. Okay, so when I change this value, we can see that it will draw a zero at the top. And so you can see zero drawn here and then it goes all the way to 1,200. But we want it to draw from 1,200 to zero, right? And so the only way to map to do that is we have to reverse it. So that's why we put zero at the end and we start with our max. So it's always your max value and then your min value for zero. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Okay, great. And I can just do this. This one. Okay, so I'm just going to show what happens when you print that. Okay, so in this case, when we try, try, try to map 10 as a real world value to a screen coordinate, it will print 504.9. And so that represents our SVG coordinate mapping value. For the y, for the y scale. Okay. Um, so now that we've created all of our scales, the next thing that we're going to be doing is we will be drawing them to the screen. And for this, we are going to be using the D three axis functions. And so I'm just look at D three axis. Okay. Okay, so D3 Access API is basically how we render our scales to the screen. And so our scales are currently just functions, but we want to show that they exist for an X and a Y, right? And so when we create them, we select a SVG, which is our drawing screen. And now we're going to create a group to draw them. And so what it does is it takes a group and then you perform some kind of transformation you, according to this convention that we talked about earlier. And 
we then call this function called dot call, which says, okay, take, um, take our X axis attribute and then draw it to the screen. So it has some magic up here in the hood. So what I've done in this example is I've taken our X line axis. So I have on this index right here, or oh, on this file right here, what I've done is I've defined a group with an ID called X line axis and another one called Y line axis. And this is where these are the groups that I will be drawing the X axis and the Y axis for the chart to the screen. So there are different ways of drawing the axis. And so when you're drawing the X axis, you call D3 axis bottom, which tells D3, okay, draw it to the bottom of the screen. And when, if you want to draw your axis to the left, for the Y scale, you call D3 dot axis left. And if you want to draw it to the right, it would be D3 dot axis right. And there's also D3 dot axis top if you're drawing scales on those sides as well. Now, the issue then is that when we draw it, we can see that if we go and inspect right here, that we need to, okay, so when we draw our scales, we can see that it adds a path element. And so when I highlight this, it draw, D3 automatically works some magic under the hood and then draws the horizontal line and each one of the individual ticks. But sometimes when you render it, you, you will not draw it to the screen. And so it may be off center or might not be showing. And so what you have to do is you have to go right here and apply a transform to adjust it to the right position. So in this case, what I've done is I've translated the scale once it's rendered with d3.call on line um, 50 and 54. And I've applied a transformation to the group and I've translated it uh, margin left number of pixels to the right, and then margin dot top uh, number of pixels on the Y. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Um, I can, okay, I'll just comment on this one. Okay, so if I go right here and I do render, Oh, they call. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so when I call this one, what it does is it doesn't, oh, it actually draws it to the top. So it doesn't, it just draws it straight from the zero, the zero, zero coordinate and it doesn't move it down. So if I wanted to move it down, then I have to apply the transform and then we can see that it moves down to the correct position. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Nice. And I do the same thing as that. oh yeah. Sorry. So I thought I thought that's what um D3 dot axis bottom was supposed to do. Was no, so what D3 dot um dot call D3 dot axis bottom does, I just have to remember that one. So D3 dot axis bottom, it says right here is it constructs a scale with the ticks on the bottom and puts the labels as Haihan said in the comment. So the axis bottom, axis left and axis right and top basically specify where do you draw the SVG um, graphic path for your labels and for your ticks. Does that answer your question? Yep, yep, that helps, thank you. Yeah, no problem. What is that, what does the, do the dollar sign do there? Does that turn, oh, uh, the dollar sign. turn that into? So this syntax right here is called string interpolation syntax. And so we can take a look, string. Okay, so this is called template literals. And template literals allow you to specify um, a JavaScript expression within um, HTML. Is 
I think how the best describe it, I don't I don't really know what the best definition is, but what it does is it you can write um, text or put in JavaScript expressions and they can be evaluated for that. And so they are called uh, template literals for that. Hmm. And they're very useful okay. as well. Yeah, it looked like it was creating a, the number oh, that you wanted in there. It looked like it was creating the the number that you wanted in there rather than a- Yeah, so if we go back bar. to my example right here, what I'm saying is, is that, okay, we are gonna, I've hard-coded the value zero right here and now i don't really know how much i want to um perform a translation in the y direction so i put this javascript expression chart height minus margin bottom and that allows me to stick in a mathematical equation and then render it with the correct syntax for the transform attribute yeah okay so it's doing arithmetic and turning it into a a, a numeric string that fits yes, into that Yes, a numeric string. That's very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, you understand that. Okay, so that's called template literals. It's very useful, and I highly recommend using it when you're doing individual calculations for your transforms. Okay. Um, okay, so I do the same thing for the y-axis and for the x-axis for our area chart and the y-area axis as well. Okay, uh, let's see, does this render? Okay, this renders. Okay, so does anyone have any questions about scales before I move on or like how to render them or how they work? Yeah, that's the other chart. Yeah, so if you go um, to the index.html, I created two different types of charts. And so there's one called line chart and then another one called area chart. And I'm using IDs here because to identify that they're different. And so IDs, as Alex has mentioned in class, and if you read the D3 book, are used to specify unique identifiers. And But if I was... Gen generating multiple line charts, I would use a class instead of the ID for that. Okay. Any questions about classes or IDs? Okay. Yeah. N no, you can have the margin. The reason why we use the margin is um, to simplify the calculation. So when I first took the class, what I used to do is I used to hard code the value, but it's a lot of trial and error. So if you kind of set the margins at the top, what it does is it allows you to change it individually at the top and then fix your charts. Because if you say you change the margin individually for one chart, but then you want to style for, for all of them, you'll have to do a lot of work if you're doing like 15, 20 charts or you have advanced animations for that. But you don't have to use that convention, though I highly recommend it because it'll make your life easier for you. Uh, okay, so now we will move on to drawing the individual data. So the first chart that I have created is called a area chart. And area charts use something called a generator, or at least that's what the visualization D3 development community call it. So we have an, a generator where we specify the area and then the certain attributes that apply to the apply to the area chart. So let's take a look at this D3 area API. Okay. So I usually like to use um, the API to find what kinds of charts or like syntax stuff. So if we look for the area syntax, um, okay, d3.area. So d3.area, what it does is it creates an area for a data set. And then depending on 
the generator uh, attributes, it will apply certain values to your X coordinate and your Y coordinate. And so what I've done here is I've called the d3.area function. And now I want to specify what do I want to use for the X coordinates. So in this case, I take in our data set and I say, okay, I want to scale the X coordinate on the SVG screen from real coordinate space to screen coordinates with X scale and data.x. And then you also want to specify a Y1, which is where the it draws from top to bottom. And you want to specify where it will end. So the Y1 coordinate will take a Y scale and scales the data dot y value and adds a margin dot top and then it says okay we want to start at that value and we want to draw from y1 to y0 and so since d3 draws from top to bottom we want it to draw from bottom to top which is why i've specified it this way right here I want to provide enough space for the coordinate. So that's why I added the margin dot top. Because if I went and I removed this right here. Okay. So if I remove margin dot top, what happens is, is that it, uh, let me just see. Yeah, margin margin dot top you can remove i guess in this example and it won't really get affected but sometimes it doesn't render or scale properly according to the size of your svg so i like to add some kind of padding to make sure that it evens out for the coordinate um so that's how you do the margin to top so we want to draw from this coordinate to a y1 and so or sorry from y1 to y0 because that's how the area chart draws. And so then we specify the chart height to the margin bottom. And what it does is it generates a filled space for the final result. And this is what you get. Some examples will show that the Y0 starts off at zero but it doesn't start off at zero. So I would not follow that. I would follow the convention that you're using to make your chart. So in this case, our convention is the chart height minus the margin bottom. Make sure that it's even. Yeah, do you have any questions? So I'm just not for Yeah. Is there something else? How is the Or am I just uh yeah that is a good question so you're asking about oh for the interactivity oh yeah we're gonna get to that so i haven't i haven't drawn the chart i'm just explaining the generators to explain how everything generates to the screen um the updating will be happening right here okay yeah no worries i should have explained that more clearly okay so then um in addition to the area generator we use a convention called the line generator and we call d3.line and we assign a x coordinate and a y coordinate so you don't need the y1 and the y0 because we do not have a filled in bottom like in the area chart so that's why you just specify an x uh, for the convention. Okay, so now that we've specified our specific um, area generators, oh, I didn't ask, are there any questions about this for line and area generators? Okay. Um, which one? Oh, so this is just a, a helper function when we render to the screen. So what you do next, okay, so in this code right here, what we do is we are going to draw our charts now to the screen. So the first thing that, oh, okay, do you have any questions? No, 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 I can uh, explain it. Oh, okay. So now I'm just going to explain how to draw that draw this. Okay, so if you go back to our index.html, we see that we have a area chart 
ID and it's in a group right here and another one for the line chart as well. And what I do first is we say, okay, the chart has yet to be created, but we want to um, attach it to that specific group. And so since it doesn't exist and we know that the line is created with the path element, we say that we select the path that has yet to be created. And there's the special um, function called dot datum. So yeah, it's a special function. It's a special function. The line generator is a special function that we pass in to generate the path. So dot datum is different from dot data because what it does is it returns only one value. It takes the entire data set and it says, okay, we're going to bind the data um, to, or bind our, a single element to our entire data set. And you usually use dot datum when you're creating paths. And if you're not creating lines or area charts, then you use dot data for that. So there's a difference between datum and data. I sometimes have used dot datum for other cases, but normally you use it when you're specifying creating paths and lines and areas. Oh, dot data or dot datum. So in the case of the line and the area chart, we use dot datum for that. That takes all of the data and says, we're going to bind it to a path element. So which is happens right here. So what I do next is I say, okay, I want to specify the path. So path is made up of multiple like points and coordinates that have been scaled and the path needs a function. And if we see right here for our area generator, we have gone and we've created the function where we say, okay, we take um, the D3 dot area and it needs an X coordinate and it needs a Y coordinate and another Y coordinate to generate the area. And when you pass it right here to the attribute dot D, um, okay, so I'm gonna render this. And we see, this is the path. So it generates all of these values right here. So this is the scaled and the what the area chart is made of. And so it draws that. And so if you have any questions about how paths work, I would recommend using MDN docs to learn about how do you draw um, a path for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for for this assignment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's doing it autom. Okay. So if you want to watch um what's happening automatically, so when I go and I click the random data, it generates a whole brand new random data set. So if we go back to this function, it says, okay, when the um, random button is clicked, so I have a random data function and it says on click, it's going to call this function random data. And so random data goes right here and it generates a brand new random data set. And it says, okay, go and create the new data set and then pass that data to the update function. So the update function gets called in random data at the very end. And so that's why you get a new data set every time. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I think I kind of understand a little bit now. It looks like you're just editing the data. I'm editing the data. So every time I click... Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, so if you're using the, you're supposed to use SVG rectangle, that's the idea for the bar graph, but I would look at how you're binding the data. So each time when you change the data, so the first thing that I would do is I would look at how to change the data set. So if you change, figure out how to change the data set, then you can see what happens when the data changes, and that will help a lot um, for the assignment. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, Okay, so each time I go and change the data with the random button, it will go and update the data set and then redraw it and clean it. 
And yeah, so that's how the area chart works and the line chart. So now for the fancy animation. So the animation goes right here and you can see it transitions really smoothly. And so there is a special um, D3 effect called D3.transition. And D3 transitions are applied when you want to change the data or the style from the previous state within the case. So right before you call, right after you change the data and you're going to update the attributes, you put the transition as I have right here for some certain amount of time. And there are different rules that you will find online about like how fast the transition should be or like how slow. And you don't want it to be too fast or too slow. So what I've done is I just chose a value for 300 and this is measured in milliseconds for the transition. So when you say d3.transition, it'll change the chart over a period of 300 milliseconds before updating. And yeah, that's the end of the tutorial. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Yeah, oh, thank so you. Nice. Yeah, thank you.